Thank you so much, Mary Beth, for the warm welcome. Sure. It's, real, it's wonderful to be here. Um, I'll start off our intros today. I'm Laura Tiemann from Social Work Services in Fairfax County Public Schools. So good morning on this brisk day in, uh, in March. Um, and so I'm one of the supervisors in social work, and I also uh, have a couple hats on. I'm a wife and a mom of four children. My, our children now are 16 down to 10. So um, really grateful to spend time together. I also have a background in play therapy, and I love to, to um, share how, how powerful play is throughout the lifespan as we support our children and ourselves. So I will turn it over to Amy and then Lori for, for intros. Hi, I'm Amy Sheldon. I am a preschool mental health clinician uh, through the early childhood assessment team here at FCPS. Um, I also have uh, two children ages 11 and eight here um, in the Fairfax County area, uh, one of our schools, and um, also have had some experiences with play therapy um, and uh, mostly working with the early childhood population. And good morning again. My name is Lori Creighton. I am with Behavior Intervention Services. I am their educational specialist. And just like my colleagues, I too am a mom as well. I have a 17 and an 18 year old. So I know how, what it's like to have young children close in age um, way, way back when, although it goes really fast. Um, I also uh, am and have been a special education teacher for kindergarten through eighth grade at various points in my career. So I'm just thrilled to be here and thrilled to present with both Laura and Amy. Thank you both. You echoed my sentiments, Lori, and uh, really grateful for our time together today. <clears throat> and as I reflect on the last couple of years, one of the things that I've been saying to myself and to others is that we really need to extend grace and compassion to ourselves and to others. So um, with that, we're gonna start with a, a little welcome activity. We will invite you to, to participate in the chat if you'd like to at points. Um, we know that you know you might be feeling a variety of different ways today. And with that, we want to introduce to you our highly scientific sheep scale. It has not yet been validated. If we look at the numbers of each of the numbers here, uh, one through nine, and just ask you to put in the chat which uh, sheep really kind of jumps out at you. Um, in terms of how you might be feeling today. You can put that number in the chat if you, oh, five. Okay, we've got a great, we even have a three and an exclamation point, right? So thank you so much, wow. Okay, so we've used this a couple of times and you all have really um, set a record for quick responding. And what this really shows us is that there's so many ways that we can be creative in terms of how we check in with ourselves and, and our children. So we've got these visuals, right? And one of them probably just draws your attention um, more than another one. And, it, and it's, it's a creative way of bringing us together. Uh, and uh, there's no right or wrong, right? We're just, we're just kind of checking out um, checking these options out when when Amy and, and Lori and I were were preparing and we just had a marvelous time getting to know one another and supporting uh, one another and reminding ourselves of how wonderful it is to uh, to grow and learn from one another. I was feeling kind of like the number four, like I don't quite know where the day is headed, right? I can't quite see, you know, as clearly as I'd like to. So um, so with that in mind, um, we're going to we're going to keep going here and look at our hopes for today. So one of the hopes uh, that I'd like to share with you is that you feel uplifted, that you feel encouraged, and that you feel like you have some more tools in your, in your toolbox. And then also, um, as you reflect with us, that maybe you kind of tune into a strength that you have in yourself or in, in the children, your own children that maybe you haven't noticed before. Um, so there's three, three specific hopes. What, uh, what is self-regulation? Why is it important? And how do we build it and support it? Um, and uh, I wrote a note for myself. It was one word. It's called 
gym. And I'm like, why did I write the word gym? The reason I wrote the word gym is because if we go into the gym and we start with a hundred pounds, we're going to be kind of discouraged, like, oh gosh. But if we start with two pounds and work up and we practice and build skills over time, then we feel um, like it's more manageable. So we want things to feel manageable today. We'll also talk about developmental expectations. And that's really, so it's hard enough without a global pandemic to know sort of what, what should I be expecting of myself and my children? But you know, I don't know if some of you might be familiar with that um, series, what to expect when you're expecting, what to expect the first year. There's really nothing like what to expect if there's been a global pandemic, right? So we want to really think about um, for, for ourselves and our children, uh, we might have a, you know, a four-year-old child but there might be some younger needs that haven't yet been supported or haven't had those opportunities to practice yet. So yet is one of my favorite words because it refers to growth mindset. It's not, you can't do this. It's more, you haven't yet learned the skill. So we will talk about expectations today. And with that, I am going to um, turn it over to Amy. Alrighty, so I wanted to start with an exercise that um, I took from our friends from at zero to three. And so I'm going to present a scenario to you. It's a Saturday, you have a birthday party you're going to in the afternoon, you haven't had a chance to buy the present yet. But you know what, um, you know exactly what you want, you're going to go, um, you're just going to zip to the mall, get it, you know what store you need, you're going to have enough time to come back, just enough time to wrap it up and then head out. So you're gonna go, you're dreading the Saturday midday parking situation at the mall, it's usually a zoo. But luckily for you, you see that, it, that open spot right in front of the building you need. So you're right close to it, you're about to pull in. And just as you do, someone zips in and steals that spot from you. And so if you wanna type in the chat really quickly, what do you do next? What's your reaction? Oh, take a deep breath. Very nice. Groan and move on. <laughs> you guys are um, uh, having healthier responses than me <laughs> with mine. Get a card with money. Oh, that's a nice one. Deep breath and keep driving. Find the next closest spot. Get upset and then look for the next one. Today is not the day. Very nice. Nice, healthy responses here. Um, so let me ask you. Oh. Depends on if my daughter is in the car. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> um, so what, how long would this situation last you? And you don't have to respond, but something to think about. Is this something where you're able to take a deep breath and kind of move forward? Are you kind of stewing a little bit on it as you're kind of going up and down the aisles looking for your present? And what situations would make it better or worse? You know, um, are you able to kind of breathe through it and move forward? Um, do you need to just pick up the phone and vent to a friend? Does it make it any worse if the person that stole your spot gave you a thumbs up and a high five? <laughs> like, you know, what, what are the situations that would make it worse? What would make it better? And then after all that, at the end of the day, you know, just like you were saying before, you still need to find a spot. You still need to head into the store and you still need to kind of buy what you need. So essentially, all those things that we're going through and having to navigate and still kind of get to the end of the line and our goal, that's a little bit of what self-regulation is. And so I'm going to, I'm sorry, there we go. So what is it? Basically, an individual's ability to gain control of their body and its functions, recognizing those states, managing powerful feelings, maintaining focus, still having to do what you're supposed to do. I wanted to read to you um, one definition. It says, it includes being able to resist highly emotional reactions to upsetting stimuli, calm yourself down when you get upset, adjust to a change in expectations and handle frustration without an outburst. Oh, whew. I mean, that's a lot for us to navigate and then to kind of think about what our little ones are trying to have to navigate when they're going through these strong emotions. It's a lot to kind of pack in. Um, what I wanted to kind of differentiate too was what the difference between self-regulation was and self-control. So they're a little bit different. Um, sometimes they're used interchangeably, but self-control is um, just kind of keeping ourselves from acting on stronger impulses. So for example, you know, kind of considering the language we might use if there's somebody in the car with us or um, keeping ourselves from, you know, 
jumping out of the car and getting into a verbal altercation or ramming the other car ahead. So that's self-control. Self-regulation is more about when, before we get into the car or as soon as we sit into the car, we're recognizing I'm in a hurry. I'm feeling a little bit frantic. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm feeling rushed. I kind of need to center myself a little bit. I got to take some deep breaths. So you kind of work through these emotions. You're recognizing what you're feeling. You're recognizing maybe you're a little bit tense. You're saying, okay, I'm going to, you know, find a good station. I'm just going to listen to some good music. I'll be in a good place when I get there. So that's more self-regulation. And so the idea is the more we're able to practice self-regulation, the less difficult it will become to uh, face self-control situations. And so we're able to kind of move through that a little bit. All right, so why is self-regulation important? Um, ultimately, lots of studies are showing when we're able to have practice opportunities for self-regulation in early childhood, because that's when all that brain development is at the the most ripe when all the neurons are firing, everything is new. Children are learning everything and experiencing things and understanding and interpreting it on their own. This is a really good time to practice self-regulation so that it becomes um, habitual and automatic and easier. And so what the, the research is showing is when you're doing it early, you um, are more likely to uh, participate in rule following for social situations, um, uh, participate in collaborations, make and maintain relationships, learning at school. You're able to be in a place where you're, you're able to sit and kind of pay attention to what's happening in the classroom and what kind of instruction is going on. All right, so just a reminder that the youngest children are you know, we're driven, they're driven by emotions, not logic. It's, it's all very kind of primal at those early stages because at the very beginning as babies, it, their entire needs are met by crying, by alerting you that way. Cause they're very aware that they cannot feed themselves. You know, they can't change their diapers. They're really dependent on adults. And so what we're trying to do is get them from that entire dependency and that you know, um, strong reaction to the emotions to finding different ways to navigate some of those stronger feelings. And so, you know, even practicing self-control, they say that, that that doesn't really become available developmentally until about three and a half to four years old because you're needing a lot of those life experiences, the languages to kind of like be able to understand and navigate and practice it all. So it's just kind of a developmental check for that. All right, so when we're in a state where we're feeling a lot of those big emotions and um, big feelings, when we're maybe really upset um, or distressed, um, our brain kind of goes into that more survival mode. So right there, you're just kind of determining threat, no threat, um, that reasoning and all, um, all that detail, that learning, that's in the back burner. So really what we're trying to do is when you're in that state, it's hard to go through all of these things, which we're asking um, a lot of both us and our children to do, to kind of be able to move forward, to get through um, that, that period. And so the idea is once we are able to practice all of these things and when we're not in that survival mode, the easier it becomes and the more automatic it becomes if we're able to practice this in times of calm. And so even that idea of calm, you know, when we're saying, okay, we need to calm down, we need to calm down, what does that mean for a child? You know, where, where did we learn that? What does calm mean? I don't know. She says calm, but I mean, right now I'm just angry. So how have we taught that to our children? You know, are we, you know, at a place where we're walking and you are we saying, you know, we we feel our body feels nice and loose. I'm happy or you're running in place and then you take a breath. Um, you know, are we teaching calm that way? Expressive communication for us, you know, we've gotten to a place where um, we've learned that it's better to communicate our wants versus just kind of pointing or grunting. If you're going to the store and you're wanting to, you know, get, uh, you know, whatever it is, uh, a food item, if you want to order French fries, it's better, you, you've learned it's automatic for us to go up and say, I would like some French fries, please, versus just kind of pointing and gesturing over there, because we've had that reinforced. And so for our little ones, if we're able to reinforce when they're saying, I'm hungry, or um, I really want to go outside, and we're kind of responding to them, and um, you know, navigating that with them. Are they learning? Oh, you know what? 
maybe this works when I use my words, I'm going to try it again. And so again, it's that repetition, it's that practice, um, paying attention to the body states planning. If your child is, you know, uh, an example, if they're waking up from nap or um, in the morning, uh, is it easy to open your eyes or is it really hard to open your eyes? Do you need maybe one more minute to just kind of rest a little bit and then we have to get going and come downstairs and paying attention to that body state, planning a little bit. So there's so many opportunities we can have um, to practice um, a lot of these skills so that they become more automatic and we're just reinforcing that learning in the beginning. Okay, so essentially we wanna go from um, responding versus reacting, just as caregivers. So we start from being able to provide all that regulation for an, uh, an infant to really kind of not helping them learn those self-regulation skills. And it all happens through that connection um, the, and re uh, relationship because we wanna be that safe um, person for that child. And so that way they don't feel like they're in that state of um, having to navigate everything on their own and interpret it on their own. They know that they can get their help and support from us. All right, so how it begins. We talked about co-regulation a little bit as far as um, us having to provide that support um, starting in infancy throughout. So co-regulation, um, explained a little bit here, just the nurturing, responsive, and supportive interactions between caregivers and children. So co-regulation, even uh, though it supports self-regulation, co-regulation is something we're gonna need throughout our lifetime. It just looks different in de uh, different developmental stages. So when we are really upset and really needing support, you know, we are still sometimes reaching out to a friend or a family member and talking about it or, you know, um, hanging out a little bit. Sometimes we need that extra um, responsiveness. And it always goes back to that nurturing relationship. Um, and again, it assists children to understand, express and modulate their thoughts, feelings and behaviors. So it helps children to make sense of their world so that they're able to um, interpret it and learn on their own, too. So co-regulation really helps that self-regulation. So for example, there, uh, when my son was about a year, a year and a half years old, we went to a neighbor's house and you know we were in their living room. My son was by the coffee table and then all of a sudden their dog comes in, very gentle dog, uh, but at the time taller than my son. This giant horse of a dog comes right in front of his face. At the time, my son had no experiences with dogs really. Um, so, he has this blank look on his face and he's looking at the dog. Then he looks at me. And at the time I'm saying, oh, look at the doggy. I say, hi, doggy. And so I'm like putting the lilt in my voice, you know, eyebrows up, that kind of thing. And so he goes back and then he smiles. And so in this moment of this like co-regulation, this is a stressful situation because no matter how gentle that dog might be, I think any of us, if any animal of any kind that we're just taller than us, came face to face with us, it's gonna elicit some kind of feels. So we're feeling this, we're, you know, it's a stressful situation, but we don't have any information on how to interpret this. And so that relationship he has with me, he's looking to see, how do I feel about this? And so what's happening then, he, he's maybe going from that stressed state, that survival mode, and able to kind of back off into that learning mode. So then he's able to say, oh, okay. So I, I still don't know exactly what's going on, but you know, mom's saying it's safe. It's, it seems pretty cool. I don't know how I feel about it. I'm gonna take a step back or you know what? I remember that stuff, my, my thumb made me feel a little better. I'm gonna try that a little bit, or maybe I'm still distressed. I'm gonna get a quick hug, but it helps him process and understand that stressed um, feeling and kind of move through that. And so we're able to kind of help in that co-regulation. And they say there's millions of those opportunities in the first few years of life. And um, the better able we're uh, there to respond and help our children through those moments, um, the more uh, better they are to adapt and learn self-regulation. And even though there's millions, the good news is, in research, they say you really only need to be responsive to about 30% of those times. So it's okay because uh, what we have to remember too is in co-regulation, 
Co-regulation is two people. That means we have to pay attention to how we're regulating too. And so are we adding to that kind of stressed and threatening environment by our reactions? Or you know, are we able to kind of check ourselves and take a second to think about that too? And you know, we're all human. We're, we're gonna have those reactions and that's okay because you know, again, there's that 30% idea, but then there's also that, um, that idea of rupture and repair. You know, we might not have handled a situation very well, but as part of co-regulation too, we can still come back and uh, check in with the child and say, you know what, I was really angry and I shouted and I said some mean things and really I should have taken a break, you know, and it's okay to kind of come back and do that too. So that's an, a little bit of co-regulation to help support that throughout development. Amy, um, do you mind if I jump in real quick? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I wanted to thank you so much for, for the examples. I just wanted to share, um, there's that tennis example, that serve and return where, you know, the ball can be positioned really perfectly and we can still miss it, right? And, we, and, and then we go pick up the ball and we try again and we're staying connected, but it doesn't mean everything goes perfectly. It means we keep on keeping on. And sometimes it's what we do after what we did and it's the oops and the keeping, keeping going. I, I also, I really appreciated your example uh, about the dog, Amy. And I, I, I was, um, I remember a number of years ago, I learned that um, when we hold uh, our young children kind of close to us, like a heart to heart, and there's that nervous system co-regulation that, that, where that physiology connects. And I started to use that when my children were very young and they would feel upset or overwhelmed. And I would feel, we would feel each one another's heart beat. And then there would be this, sense that um that there was safety and that we could we could kind of keep going so that that nervous system begins to settle and i don't know about you but as an adult sometimes i just use way too many words with with young children and it's um that what we do with our bodies is so uh is so important so i just wanted to to offer that um, yeah and i mean i think with trying to use that those words too and sometimes when we're just trying to get them to a regulated state you know and we're we're really kind of trying to coach them through when really they they just need a moment to kind of move through this moment too and i think it seems sometimes counterintuitive because it seems like when a child is up here you have to be higher and keep going and escalating and you know it's just going to keep um you know, a battle of who can uh, tough it out the most when really if if you're up here, sometimes you just need someone down here to kind of bring you down. And again, it's that back and forth um, to be able to be in tune that way. And I think sometimes just being there as they're kind of kicking and screaming and saying, I know you're really upset. I'm, I'm here. I, you know, it's OK. And just bringing that calm even with my son, you know, a lot of um, regulation they talk about is temperament too, and how um, a child's temperament affects how um, they can interpret self-regulation. And some, like my son is just a ball of sensitivity and feeling, and, you know, there's no question about how he feels. And it's just when he really needs, is running hot, the thing that helps him so much is he really likes the soft. He, you know, you think, oh, you know, you need to go cool down in the corner. And for some kids, very responsive. For him, he needed to hug his pillow or he needed to kind of um, go with all his stuffed animals. Even at eight, he's understanding, um, he found a cotton ball somewhere and he liked the feel of it. And he's understanding, you know, oh, um, is it okay if I put it in my pocket and go to school? And, you know, you're, you're helping them to navigate what might work too. So, yeah. And, you know, my daughter who's 11 now, I did say maybe not, I didn't have the best parenting moment and said something that she brought up days later. And we were able to talk about that. And, you know, if there's, it's not a time limit either. You're able to kind of talk through those moments and learn together because begin again, co-regulation is really that relationship between both of you. It's not just one directional. Um, Dr. Jerry Costa, uh, he's a developmental psychologist out in New Jersey. He has um, created an, acronym here, Agile, as uh, far as something to remember for co-regulation. So you have A for affect, 
And again, it's just how are you conveying your emotions? Um, do you have the soothing voice? Um, are you supportive, affectionate in those moments? Gesturing, your facial expressions, your body language, intonation. How is your voice sounding? How is that message coming across? Um, you know, it's very different if you're saying, well, thanks for helping versus thanks for helping means two different things, but it's the same exact words. And so this is actually something that's helpful for even pre-verbal children um, or kids mastering language still. You know, it, it means something to say, oh, I'm so sorry, your tower fell down. You know, you're so upset. You know, the, the child's feeling, yeah, you get it. You, you're feeling me. Um, latency, just waiting, kind of taking that pause to see what the child might need and checking yourself as well. And engagement, again, just continuing with those relationships. And so here, just some regulation considerations throughout early development. And again, it's just that co-regulation and that need of support happens throughout all of development. And no matter what developmental stage you see from adults to infants, it's always, they're always gonna have that nurturing, caring relationship as part of it. Um, but again, you're moving from infants who you're um, providing all that regulation support to, to um, developing language and motor skills, uh, giving toddlers the words for emotions. Um, and we're gonna talk more about that in just a second. With preschoolers, it's getting, um, they're able to kind of conceptualize some things and practice some skill building, like the finger breathing and knowing um, some yoga breaths. An elementary, a little more complex where we can talk about, um, you know, we can do role plays or conflict resolution and talk about that a little bit more. So there's ways to support. Co-regulation happens all throughout. It just looks differently in different um, stages too. All right, so I'm gonna hand it over to Laura to talk about building self-regulation skills. Thank you so much, Amy, that uh, really strong foundation on what self-regulation is and how we how we start to to develop it and practice it over time kind of reminds me of if if I have a three-year-old and I take them outside and I show them a bike and I say so here's your helmet get going and I'll see you in an hour um you know have a great ride so we would think well gosh your three-year-old doesn't really yet know how to ride a bike but if we think about all the skills that are involved in riding a bike right all the different things we have to practice and teach and awareness we can use that metaphor for self-regulation, um, but where we want to start is, is with ourselves in terms of that self-awareness. So you might have heard this acronym. So this would be the, the next slide, Amy. Thank you. That acronym of um, hungry and angry, or if you do the combo, hangry, lonely, and tired. And just using myself as an example, and, I, and if you can, uh, please feel free to, to, to uh, put in the chat, if you can, when I think about the moments where I've not brought my best self to my children, usually one of these things was happening, if I think back, right? And I mean, just yesterday, I was frustrated about something else and then had a sharper tone with one of my sons. Um, and I, I was aware that we were presenting today and I said to myself, okay, Let's 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 practice. So I went back and, and I said, Dominic, um, you know, earlier when um, I was impatient with you, there was something else that was on my mind, and I want to I want to apologize. And uh, so so we want to take a moment to really tune into our own needs. And for some of us, that's something we do regularly. For others, um, maybe it wasn't in our background. It was kind of always focused on other people and what they need. And, you know, eventually at some point down the road in two months, I might take a vacation, you know, and that's, that's not the same as building in little uh, moments to check in um, with myself and say, okay, so how, how am I doing not only physically, but mentally, spiritually, emotionally, um, and if I'm, for example, some things are out of our control, if I'm feeling tired, even just knowing, okay, so what is it that I can take off my plate today to kind of lower that temperature a little bit? Okay, so now we will head to this, uh, this word discipline, which I always, I'm always amazed. So when we think of the, the Latin, we go back to the Latin root, it means to teach and to learn. So 
there were a number of times before I learned that timeouts were not really developmentally helpful. Um, I have not yet seen a timeout in my past um, where the child, my child came out and said, mom, that was the best timeout ever. And not only do I know that it's not right to hit my sister, but I forgot to take my five deep breaths and I'm so sorry I caused disruption in our household. So I've never had skill building happen during a timeout. That's because the child hasn't had the chance to really learn and grow. What is the skill? What is the skill that the child needs help with, right? And when is best to teach it? When is that moment of opportunity? So if I'm taking a calculus test, that would not be the time to uh, practice a new skill um, because it's, it's not when my brain is most ready. So we think about new learning that we've had either recently or in the past when we've learned a new skill or we've practiced something, we were at ease, we were, we were feeling uh, confident, we were feeling open-minded and our stress level is probably lower. And those are really important ingredients for when and how we wanna teach and guide um, our children. So we will spend a, a couple more minutes here on talking about some practicals. When we're thinking about identifying our emotions and how we're doing, it's really helpful to start with uh, tools that are outside of us. For example, um, books like What Should Danny Do um, is, is one of those choose your own adventure books. So it allows children to choose uh, where they wanna go and make choices and kind of explore different perspectives. These are available on YouTube. There's a bunch of different options for how you want the book read. Um, so you can choose what kind of draws your attention. My body, um, was it my body sends a signal? I can't, let me see here. Let me read that. Okay, my body sends a signal. Yes, uh, is another example of a book. But when we are reading to children and we're able to uh, look at a character together, we're able to think about um, what they might be feeling or experiencing, it's outside of themselves. And that's the best way to start. So when we model as adults, or we use an, a book or visuals like we did with the sheep, we're starting to help grow a skill um, and it's practicing it. And it's gonna get, start to get closer and closer and closer to internalizing, right? That's where it becomes my own and I learn it and it comes naturally, but not without practicing first. And there's so many ways that uh, books can be a tool uh, for that when we are also learning empathy, perspective taking, and like I said, how might a character um, be doing? So this next slide is an example of a chart which has emotions on it. And I don't know if, if some of you have seen the, the movie Inside Out. That's another great example of ways that we can, oh, and thank you, Mary Beth. So yes, so many books in the PRC, the Parent Resource Center Library, that can be a support when it comes to um, identifying and, and working with our emotions. And some of our emotions are more comfortable than others. So um, for example, on this chart, there are, are many emotions that um, if, so I, in the chat, which, which of these emotions do you find it, find it hardest to kind of support in your children, the children in your lives? Which, which, ones, which one is the hardest or ones are the hardest? You could put them in the, in the chat um, because it's, it's not easy sometimes to different, disappoint it. Oh, thank you. Yes, disappointed, nervous, jealousy, <laughs> bored, jealous, angry, right? And you can see the uh, like above the, the the angry, the the you know the eyebrows and the uh, you know the 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 different body sensations that go along, hurt and scared, and these. So this chart is a tool, and like any tool, we can um, use it to help us with the, with, with the teaching and the guiding and day-to-day -day, um, day -day life too, when we're out and about. Um, and, you know, for example, let's say someone drops something when they're walking and we might help them pick it up. You might use it as a chance to reflect, how do you think the person was feeling when they dropped their things? Um, and then you're, you're using it as a chance to reflect together on an experience that's outside of yourselves, which is also easier then the really intense experiences. I want to start with the ones that are easier to access uh, for, for all of us. Thanks for, for, uh, for chiming in there. And one Amy. thing too, I think as parents, it's really hard 
to have our children hurt or feel any kind of different emotions. And I think that it's important for them to experience it, but at the same time, we can still, instead of constantly having them be in a state of happy, you know, we can still help support them through it by kind of processing it with them later as well. And I think that's important to kind of let kids experience some of these things too, because, you know, as a parent, we just, we want to make sure they're okay. And to make that connection too, Amy, with what you were sharing earlier between self-regulation and self-control, these tools that Laura is, sh- are share- Laura is sharing are the tools that are used when the students aren't necessarily experiencing that state of anger or feeling scared, but you're doing it when they are in that state of calm. And that's where you develop that self-regulation. So when those events occur that create those emotional feelings, strong emotional feelings, they are developing skills for the self-control. So the teaching and learning and practicing um, through books, through charts, and through some other tools that we'll share help develop those self-regulation tools that will allow for um, hopefully better um, responses when something is um, kind of thrown at our students or our children and they or they experience something that is unexpected at the moment, and they'll be able to keep themselves in a safe place because they've seen it modeled in character books, they've been able to identify it in charts, they've practiced breathing. So it'll be something that they've experienced when their brain can actually learn, which is when they're calm. And it sounds very frou-frou sometimes because you're like saying, oh, you know, I'm going to label this and what have you. There is a moment when my kids were much younger where I think, I can't remember if it's my daughter or my son. They came and they were like pounding on my keyboard as I was working, essentially telling me, don't work on the weekend. I, I want your attention. And so I said something along the lines of, um, you're pounding my keyboard because you're trying to get my attention. You want me to play with you. Um, but you can't, you, or something like, you know, you have to let me know with your words. And I, now that I know I'm going to, you know, do five minutes, whatever it was. And really like, maybe, I don't know, 30 minutes later, my son pulls my daughter's hair and she was like, you're pulling my hair because you're mad about, you know, blah, blah, blah. So it was like, it it happened. Now, if I kept doing that, maybe they'd be in a different place saying that now, but it, it works and it's, it's modeled. And, you know, it's, it's something that they can learn as this is normal and this is effective. So, so marvelous. Um, I did want to share that years ago, I was realizing that I was trying to rescue my children from feeling disappointed, right? And not allowing them to feel that. I was talking to my mom. She's like, but so Lara, here's the thing is I really tried to keep you from feeling disappointed when you were a kid. We had this great conversation. I was like, oh, and that's why I feel so uneasy when um, my daughter was trying to get something to the mailman and we missed the mailman and tears, you know, and we had to you were really wanting to give that letter to the mailman. And, you know, we worked on a plan B and it turns out he came back around the, the street later, which was amazing, right? To have that plan B happen sooner than I was anticipating. But our own story of how we process emotions or how we, and, and, and my mom and I were very transparent about it. Um, it, was, it was validating though, so that I understood a little more about why I wanted to sort of swoop in and take that away versus you're disappointed and how do we, how do we work through this, right? And, and also that um, really important points around practicing when we're in our best learning state. So speaking of practicing, here are some examples of skill building opportunities. Um, we have, so if, I don't know if you, you know this one where you can, you can imagine what type of flower that you'd like to put on your finger. You imagine a flower and you can smell the flower, you know, and breathing in and then slowly blow the petals. And when we extend the exhale, that really sends signals to our nervous system that it's okay to relax. And some children uh, prefer to have, you know, more of that imagination. I'd like to choose a tulip or I'd like to choose a rose or I'd like to choose, but it, it kind of depends on what, what works for you. There's so many ways to, um, to talk about breathing. And of course, um, 
bubbles. So bubbles in front of a computer screen is not nearly as fun as bubbles in front of people. But I did want to show uh, something if I can. Okay, so, so the bigger the bubble, the slower the breath. So if you breathe, if you blow bubbles and there's lots of little bubbles, that's pretty shallow breathing and you can, and, you know, children can pop the bubbles and you can do a lot of things around self-regulation with bubbles. If you catch a bubble um, on the wand, which takes practice, right? And you can, and say, depending on um, how young the child is and how joyful they would find this to be, you can ask them to pop the bubble when you say their favorite color. So Amy, what is your favorite color? Sorry, red. Okay, okay, red. So when I say red, you can pop the bubble. So I say blue, yellow, orange, raspberry, make it a little tricky, a little silly, and red. And then, oh yeah, there she is, right. So she had to wait, she was, a we were attuned, and then, and then you, you know pop the bubble when when I and you can do that with colors you can do that with animals you can do so many things um, and what you're doing is you're making pathways between a playful moment and a learning moment do all playful moments need to be learning well they are intrinsically because play is so powerful uh, but there are so many things that we can do to teach to teach these to to build these skills and we'll. Um, we will move forward here to uh, one of my favorites is the five finger breathing. So breathing in and then breathing out. Is this, this is mountain breathing. Has anyone done this before? Um, I'd love to, I'd love to have uh, your thoughts in the chat about um, breathing activities that you have used uh, before that you love. Uh, one thing um, that, my daughter and I did was we put our, so with her small hand against my larger hand, we put our hands together and then, then she would trace our fingers. So this was an example of co-regulation. Um, and then over time, she was able to do this by herself. Okay, figure eight breathing, balloon breathing. Yeah, so part of it is whatever works for you. Oh, if your ch child loves a stuffed animal, you can lay down next to them and you can watch, they can watch the stuffed animal rise and fall with their, with their stomach going up and down. So there's that concrete visual and you're giving Teddy a ride. And sometimes Teddy's gonna be going slower or fast. And when you're doing this with them also, I mean, you're doing your own relaxation. A little one loves breathing in and out by looking at my Apple watch reflects so many creative examples. And when you're talking about, oh, thank you for talking about our older students because one of the teachers um, that shared with me a number of years ago, um, this was, I think these were sixth grade students. She said, I didn't really think, she taught language arts. She said, I didn't really think the students would be into breathing. Well, she built it into her classroom at the beginning of the class. So one day she said, one of the students raised her hand and said, Miss G. And she said, yes, he's like, we forgot to breathe. Of course, it's really funny when, when, when she said it like that. But it is, it is wonderful to acknowledge and pay attention to our breath, um, no matter how old we are. And Amy, when you're talking about dealing with tough moments that happen, you know, where there's a lot of activated emotions, feeling our feet on the floor, and just paying attention to our breathing, we can practice that. It, it doesn't mean that the tough moment goes away, but it means that we're going to be able to draw more of our better self. Speaking of our better self, one day, a number of years ago, I needed a timeout, and I to my I wanted to go in my. I said I'm stressed, and I went in, and I got this knock on the door, Mom, and I said, Yes, you know that tone, and Claire's like, Do you need mountain breathing? And I was like, oh my goodness sake, yes. And there's where we all grow and they're humbling moments, but she knew I was having a tough moment and we, we care about each other in these moments and we practice and we recover uh, and uh, breathe like a bear book. Okay, these are wonderful examples in the chat. I love the, the stories and the examples of how, how we can uh, 
we can learn from yeah. from one another. Uh, Amy, anything anything that you wanted to add on this on this slide about the breathing? Oh no, just the one thing. Um, my daughter, when she was in kindergarten, I think she liked the five finger breathing because it was something that she could do like just do under her desk and take a moment and do and not draw attention to herself a little bit, but kind of still a reminder. And similar to, to the cotton Sorry, ball Laura. story too, just what are those uh, calming tools? Go ahead, Lori. No, I was just going to say that sometimes, and it, and it is not, all of these strategies may not work for all of our children and that's okay. Part of it is figuring out what works for our, for our children. Um, what I, I did observe um, in a third grade classroom um, just a couple of years ago after we had done a training on breathing with the staff, I was in there just supporting the classroom um, and the class, I, the teacher felt like the class was, was having too many side conversations and she was starting to get frustrated. And so what she did, she stopped teaching and she turned around and she goes, wow, I'm, my body is feeling um, very frustrated right now. I'm just going to pause and I'm going to do um, a triangle breath and then I'm, I'm going to come back because I don't want to either yell or say something that I'm going to regret. So just excuse me for a moment. And she just stepped to the side and she, with her finger, took her deep breath in, held it and exhaled. And then she did it again. And what was fascinating is that the second time there was a collective breathing in from the students. You heard this from the students then silent as they were holding it. And then you heard all of the students exhale together. So I thought that was a beautiful example of using breathing, not making, asking, requesting, requiring the student to do it, but just modeling it, co-regulating students coming in together to do it. And the whole tone of that classroom shifted and the students were able to really then dive into the lesson together with the teacher afterwards in a much more focused, ready state. It was beautiful. So even as a parent modeling that for your students, even if it's not something that necessarily works for them in the moment, if it works for you, go for it and model it and use it. And actually something to try too, um, there's been a couple times where um, either a child I'm working with or one of my own kiddos, when they're kind of in that dysregulated state and just kind of really um, just feeling their strong feelings and being really upset, sometimes I've just kind of sat with them and just gone. And so it just kind of breaks them a little bit because there's that whole mirror neuron thing where they're kind of... Um, you know, you're going back and forth and they're, they're catching on to that. And, and sometimes I've also worked with kids who said, I hate breathing. I don't want to do breathing. And then you have like the cotton ball or something else. So there's different strategies. And so there's not just one way to do it. So true. And, and Amy has in the chat um, about her five-year-old has learned some of the different ones, but hasn't been able to use them in the moment yet. And what a beautiful phrase that really talks about being on the way, you know, on the way with skills and trying to see what works and, and really tuning in and noticing um, the individual strengths and needs of your, of your children and, and, and trying, trying things. And, and so we'll, we'll turn our attention to, um, to play for, for a couple moments and I will contain myself because I, I just love, I love uh, talking about play and I love playing. Um, and speaking of bubbles, one of my neighbors saw me a number of, of, of years ago and he said, um, Laura, I thought I saw you blowing bubbles by yourself on the sidewalk. And I said, well, Keith, what would have been wrong with that? And anyway, I was with our youngest, but the point was um, when, we, when we engage in playful moments, joyful moments, uh, moments that involve laughter and connection, our brains and bodies change. And Play is uh, not only something that is critical for development in terms of social interactions, um, perspective taking, uh, growing our understanding of, of, of trying out new things, but when we think even as an adult, what can we do for hours where we lose track of time? If you want to put in the chat some, some, um, some a memory from when you were a child, uh, one of your favorite play memories, has incredible meaning right? And, and play changes throughout the lifespan, but um, it's very much connected to academics. 
And we also know that when children are very, very stressed, they don't play. They don't play as much because the part of the brain and body that's relaxed and at ease and able to kind of try new things is, is in more in that survival mode. And so playful opportunities are important for us to, um, to promote. And for example, the red light, green light game, you're having to uh, playing in nature, water for hours, playing in the woods. Yes, yes. Um, when there's games like red light, green light, you're having to pay attention, wait, stop. You're, pay, you're, you're having to use all of those um, self-regulation skills, but you're doing it in a way that it's, it's, it's kind of, it's fun and it's novel, and, but you're practicing those skills. And those are the same skills you bring into the classroom, you bring onto the soccer field, you bring into you know, violin lesson, wherever it is you're, you're going in life, um, exploring. So keeping it very real. So uh, when our youngest was born, our next uh, oldest was three. And I was talking to one of my friends, I said, I am so tired. I am just, I, I could take a nap you know, for a long time. And so a little bit of time goes by and I walk by Joey, who's three and he's playing with his stuffed animals. And one of his stuffed animals says to the other stuffed animal, you are so tired, you need a long, long nap. Well, children process life through, they, they, they work it through, they process it, they bring meaning, they bring control over things that sort of feel out of their control. Um, so I wanted to, to give a shout out to, uh, to Joey and his uh, the puppet story. Um, and then we'll talk a moment about awe. So awe and wonder. Um, awe and wonder, um, when you have moments that bring you out of yourself, like we have um, a bird feeder and we have three different types of woodpeckers, those moments where we're watching the birds and we're tuning into them, um, those moments of awe and wonder affect our physical health. And it, yes, you're not sort of tending to other life responsibilities but at that moment, but when you return back to life, life's demands, you bring the fruit of that experience with you. So um, experiences of faith, nature, things that bring us outside of ourselves, help us be in the present moment. And how could I forget to talk about um, the role of laughter? So laughter oh, in the chat. So how many times a day does the average child laugh? Any guesses in the chat? 50, well, that's good, 50, 200, we're getting closer, 75. It is actually 300, Mary Elizabeth, 300 and Sophie, 300, 300 times a day, children. Adults, uh, 10. So we gotta change that. Laughter is so powerful and it is, um, it lowers blood pressure and it, it, uh, it's, it's kind of like has the effects of jogging without, uh, without jogging, not offending any joggers in the room, in the house. Um, but laughter, our brain chemistry changes with laughter. So children do this naturally. And when we as adults can um, join with them in laughter, those are really powerful moments to be kind of tuned into. What is it that brings joy in laughter? And so we want to kind of get that that uh, our rating, our adult rating up. I have a laughter rating scale that I made up that I sort of bring with me throughout life that I try to remember where is the joy in laughter. And it doesn't mean we don't have difficult feelings, but we also want to look at where we can uplift those moments and notice them because sometimes as adults, we tune into things that aren't going right, which we need to be tended to. And we sometimes forget that we that there are all these positive and beautiful uh, things to do. So for the next slide, these are just some examples of activities, specific activities that you can refer to when we think about developing self-regulation skills, the type of activities. I know there was a lot of creativity and we couldn't really get out of the house with virtual field trips and ways to access experiences, um, not only physically and concretely, but through the computer. Stories, storytelling, um, acting out, uh, moving our, our body. There's, a, there's um, that, I don't know if any of you have done that activity that is called, and it can be, you can make it as, uh, as silly as you like, but it's mirroring. So for example, you would have uh, your child follow your hands and your body as you move in different ways. And you don't have to use any words. I'm just using words because I'm explaining it. And then you can take turns following their lead. They turn, take turns following your lead. And it becomes a way to co-regulate, but they're also what? They're paying attention to physical movements. They're waiting, they're watching, 
they're maybe not using their voice, they're having to uh, practice spatial awareness. All of these things, they're, they're maintaining control over their physical selves, maybe in other spheres of their life, that's a real struggle. They get to experience success in that way. Um, but you're also using literally the, the brain, the, the mirror neurons. So those are the neurons that this is, these are the same neurons that when someone walks in the room and they're kind of having, um, they, they experience an emotion, you sort of pick up on it. So it, you're, you're tuning into that, but the mirroring activity uh, helps us with, with that. Um, matching, sorting, puzzles. So the sky, the sky is the limit here. And we wanted to, um, oh, Lori, I wanted to invite you to talk a little about the Harvard Center on the Developing Child, which is a marvelous set of uh, resources. Yes, and we have, um, we referenced it towards the end so that you can um, explore the website on your own. Uh, the Harvard Center on, on the Developing Child has just wonderful, basically like a one pager that really does explain developmentally ways in which we can encourage our students, our children to develop these self-regulation skills alongside us. And they break it down into ages three through five or five through seven. And what I love so much about it is that it, you know, our children, especially during COVID, experienced a lot of interaction with family members and peers through technology because there was no other choice. And especially with this age group, that is the way that they connect. That is the way that they play. Now that the weather is nice, we are able to interact with real people. Uh, it is certainly something we would encourage you, your children to get out and do something away from the screen to further develop those skills. Whether it's that you give them a box of um, materials that you found out that you found around your home, like um, tissue boxes and paper towel rolls and tissue paper and glue um, and put, put them outside if you don't want to um, have your house get all messy and let them just create something or have music and let them, my daughter, when she was younger and her best friend, we had to sit through so many dance recitals that they put on in our backyard because that was their way of just acting things out, expressing themselves. It's so nice that we can finally get to a point now where our children can do that again. So we definitely want to encourage you um, to have your children explore with you how to develop those imaginary play skills and experiences, storytelling, movement, and games. Um, for my family, my husband was so good about this. Our children have experienced game time with us since they were little and I'm talking three four years old as soon as they were able to follow very short simple directions and now with my daughter home from college this week that is what she wants to do with our family she wants to play games every night and so we do we've come back to that which is so nice and I know that's something that is a gift that we'll keep on giving she she will continue to want to do that and when she if she if and when she chooses to have a family, I'm pretty sure that's something that she will, um, you know, continue that tradition on with them and bring it back to us as well. So anything that allows for those interactions, um, now that we can really explore that again, we encourage and that Harvard Center on the Developing Child has some really nice ways to um, encourage children to get out in case you're looking for some ideas outside of what you're currently doing, something just new and different. That dance party, I, that brings back such, I have to call my sister on my way home today, tell her that I was thinking of her because it does, it just puts a smile on my face. Um, and hopefully your children will have those shared moments um, that they'll reflect upon as they get older as well. And it will make you feel all warm and happy that you were able to experience that with them. That's so beautiful. And thinking about uh, traditions and, and, and rituals that we want to sustain over time. It's, and, 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 uh, when our children are little, sometimes it's hard to imagine that they will get older and more independent. And that story is such a helpful one, uh, Lori, uh, but go ahead. You can take it away. Well, and sometimes when we're interacting with our kids, things don't necessarily go the way that we would want them to go because we're human and our children are learning. And there are going to be situations where um, 
our children or we are not necessarily calm. So this slide reminds us that sometimes it's okay to do nothing in the moment. Pause, take a breath, go to your happy place, wherever that might be. Mine is certainly the beach and I hear the water splashing. So when we have um, opportunities during states of calmness to practice that, it makes it easier to access that, that um, self-regulation or self-control in the moment. So when we, let's say our, we have a child who's having a tantrum, which of course never happens, right? Because everybody is perfect. <laughs> My teenage kids still have tantrums. I probably still have tantrums, to be honest with you. Um, the, it is really beneficial to take 10, 15 seconds and stop, think, and then respond instead of react. And that's where we want to go with it. So if we react, we typically do that in a heightened state of emotion. And that's where sometimes we end up either saying or doing things that later on we repair. Oh, you know, maybe I shouldn't have said that to you. I'm sorry, this is what I'm going to try to do better next time. You know, what can we do moving forward? If we give ourselves a little grace, period, and we take that breath or we go to our happy place, we can turn that reaction into a response, which is just a more thoughtful way um, to interact in a moment that might not be so easy to interact with somebody at. So sometimes we need a visual to remind us. Um, some people like to put little signs around their home that says something like, you know, something like this. Don't, don't just do something, stand there or deep breaths or um, we can do this or something. Or maybe it's just one word that can kind of trigger something like grace. And that can remind you in those moments that it's okay. You don't have to necessarily go right in. You can step back and take a moment for yourself so that you end up interacting with your child in a way that is more productive. What it also allows us to do when we do pause, it helps us avoid power struggle. And do you know who wins a power struggle? Nobody. Nobody ever wins a power struggle because it, it becomes a cycle. So the student does something or your child does something and we are either hungry, tired, right? Angry. <laughs> um, and so we respond or react to that. And then that doesn't meet our child's needs. So then they say something else or they cry louder or they stomp their foot more and we get more frustrated. And then we're like, stop that because we're in the middle of the grocery store and it's embarrassing. And then the chi your child is like, but I'm hungry. And then you're like, I'm gonna feed you when we get home. And it just keeps going and going. So nobody wins. So sometimes it's okay to just pause and not engage. That's the best way to end a power struggle is to not get into one in the first place. And how do we not get into one? We pause. So give yourself the gift of time to self-regulate before you react so that we can then respond. And again, this comes back to modeling. So now this is an effective way to model for our children and to support them while they really need us. Because what they're telling us in that moment is something's not working for them and they need our help. And so it's hard to help someone else when we are escalated as well. So we want to keep ourselves calm so that we really can be the help that our children need. Amy, did you want to share something? No, I'm sorry. It was just hovering over my mute. But yes, I, I agree as far as the um, the the practicing ourselves um, because I I'm a little bit quick tempered, and uh, you know what we're modeling to and how we're kind of reacting to situations is uh, pretty helpful. It's something you know it gives us perspective mm -hmm. too. You know how often are we able to kind of stop and pause instead of engage or to go into the text war or yell about cake when it's really not about cake. Or something <laughs> like that. Right. And sometimes we don't know what it is and that's okay. We can come back to it when everybody is feeling better and talk about it. Again, we learn 
really the only time that we can learn from something is when we're all in that calm state. We don't ever learn when we're already kind of um, escalated or, or anxious or feeling something other than calm. So we want to have those, those teachable moments sometimes after if we weren't able to have it before. And the way that we do interact with our children, how, how we support them is so important. So in, instead of connecting with them in a questioning way, like, um, why are you not listening, right? We can turn it into what is making this hard for you right now? Going back to what Laura shared earlier about how we communicate, our tone, our body language, the words we use. So we want to make sure that um, they're all matching so that it's believable. And we do it in a way that opens up those lines of communication to our children instead of um, it kind of closing off the lines of communication when, and that happens when we are kind of accusing them of like, what, you know, why are you not doing something? Sometimes they may not know in the moment why they're not able to follow our direction. So we want to open that and offer some support. That is a really great segue into this next slide, which is one of the primary ways we can help move from reacting to responding is setting up routines and uh, predictable, a sense of predictability for children. And as humans, we all need routines, right? Routines stabilize us. This is a slide that um, we've presented for many, you know, many years. But when we think about COVID and the disruption of routines, right, or I don't even know what, how do I even, what, I don't have a routine for this, right? What, there were so many changes that when children came back physically into the classroom, many of them had no experience with, I put my coat here and my backpack, and this is what I do when I, you know, this is the, the, the hello time to greet my teacher. So there's all these rituals and routines. Um, routines help us know what to expect and it supports that sense of predictability. Some of our children struggle with moments of transition and routines become even more important. Then um, 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 uh, one of the things about routines is we can look at deepening a routine and making it a ritual. So for example, if you're asking your child to put their plate on the counter, that may be an expectation that you have and something that happens after dinner, but a ritual helps with the meaning. This is part of taking care of you and our family. You're taking really good care of your family when you bring the plate there. Or with bathing, you know, and, and the, the sometimes struggles around brushing teeth and, 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 and bathing. It's, this is part of taking really good care of your special self, right? I know, and how do you feel after your bath? Oh, I feel really relaxed, okay. So we're trying to really unpack the meaning. And we know as, as adults too, when we understand the why, we can, we can bring more of our full selves to that, um, to that really that expectation. Um, so I wanted to, to just mention routines and rituals and for children who haven't had, remember the bike, you know, taking a three-year-old out, you need to ride the bike, haven't had the chance to learn some of that. We can sometimes make assumptions that the child should do X, Y, Z when maybe they haven't yet been walked through what that looks like, sounds like, back to what Amy said about, you know, be calm. Well, I might not know what calm looks like and sounds like. Um, but if someone says, well, you know, your, Laura, your arms are relaxed, your face, is relaxed, your, um, your hands aren't clenched anymore, you have a smile. So trying to help children with those noticing so they begin to understand, oh, this is what it's like for, my, for me to be at ease with myself. Lori, did you have um, things on this slide? I wanted to make sure to check in with you. I, I mean, I think you covered it beautifully. I think that it's, it is a beautiful transition when some routines become rituals because it just ups the, the importance in that family dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, those, those rituals become something that people look forward to, um, that they cher cherish, they respect. Um, and it doesn't, it, it can be, it doesn't have to be religious, right? It can be anything that brings that family together that when missed, you know, you kind of long for it. And so it's, it's not, it just is nice when, when, um, when that natural kind of progression occurs. All right, so we have spent um, 
a beautiful amount of time together this morning. And we would love a little feedback on just um, kind of as you're processing, where are you in your learning? Do you feel based on our discussion this morning and the knowledge that you've already brought with you to our time together, that you are still learning and that you do understand some of what we talked about today, um, but would like some further clarification? Do you feel like you have a really good understanding of where we are um, based on our tools and some of the background information that we share? Um, I can tell you that after even in this field, I probably have a good understanding, but I would never, I don't know that I consider myself an expert in as a parent. Um, so I would just model that this is probably where, where I am. And then, or do you feel like you've got this? Like you really understand a lot of the key concepts that we've talked about and are excited to be able to implement them along the way. So some of us may kind of hover between a couple of these. So Mary Beth kindly put this together for us. And as you probably see on your screen, the poll has popped up. So you would just select um, which one of these best suits you. We see a lot of people already um, answering. We're so grateful for that. We have almost, oh, we have almost everybody already. 71% of people have already participated. Thank you. So I don't know what Mary Beth, if you can share the results with the um, group, but it does appear in case you aren't seeing the actual graph that the majority of, um, of all of us do feel that we are in that good understanding. There are some people both who are still along that learning curve, both at the beginning part and further along. And the best part about being a parent is the community that we build together so that we all can support each other to get to that I got this place, um, you know, and, and feeling confident about what, what and how we're supporting our children. Thank you so much for participating in that. So as we come together um, to wrap up our time for our first presentation, we want to really thank you for joining us today and let you know as was shared at the beginning of our time that we have two more presentations that we are hopeful that you'll be able to join us on April 22nd and May 20th at the same time. Uh, the April 22nd topic is supporting healthy habits and routines. So that kind of builds on where we are leaving off today. And then on May 20th, it's growing through those tough moments. And again, um, these will build on each other, but in no way, shape or form, you have to attend all three in order to get something out of um, our presentation. So if you're not able to join us in April, please um, come back in May, we would love to see you. So as we wrap up our time together, we just all three of us, Laura, Amy and I wanna thank you so much for joining us. And we do want to open up the remaining uh, few minutes of about 15 more minutes of time for some questions or comments, they don't have to be questions. We would also just love to hear where you are, um, any feedback that you have so that as we plan for our next training, we are doing it by meeting your needs. Laura and Amy, any other final thoughts before we open it up for questions or comments? Uh, no, I just wanna leave it as um, also providing our contact information too. So we'd love to hear any questions or comments now. And you know, as you think of them or need additional information and support, please feel free to reach out to us at any time too. And our hope is that these times together will really help you feel supported as you work with your children and, and heading towards next school year. So there's this kind of intentionality about the timing here. So we have a question. Sure, thank you, ladies. So um, we have some questions. Um, our, our child sometimes hits crisis mode right as it's time to leave to catch the bus. How do we validate his feelings but still stay on schedule? So that, that's a great question. And I feel like this year, we're actually hearing that quite a bit more than we have in the past because our children haven't, especially our youngest children have not had a lot of experience with having to get up and get on a bus and go to school because they 
either weren't in school at all or they were in school virtually. And I, I would say that um, if you start going back to routines, start potentially the night before laying out your, let your child pick out their clothes, put their toothbrush out, uh, maybe read stories about getting on the bus as part of your bedtime routine. Some of those activities that help create a routine the night before can also allow for those routines to um, continue in the morning that might make it a little easier for you. Amy, did you have more yeah, to share? Just along those same lines too, um, finding those times to practice and be successful, even if it's chunking out too. So something related like um, going to soccer practice and getting to the car on time, let's practice what that looks like, or um, you know, making it to the bath or shower right after dinner or whatever that uh, routine looks like. If if it's a goodbye issue as far as separation, do you have those rituals or I love you moments, the connections that they can have that would be helpful, kind of exploring um, what the need is at that moment too. Yeah, I was just gonna echo the, um, the goodbye ritual and some kind of relational moment there um, that can be thought about in terms of that child's need for connection. Also, sometimes, I don't know the neighborhood situation, but sometimes um, walking to the bus with other children in the neighborhood can be helpful. Sometimes it's a certain parent that it's harder for one parent than the other. And so we kind of look at sometimes changing it up to allow for um, some of those practice, the separation moments to practice them a little differently. So I also think maybe exploring it with the school, the school team they might, and even just knowing that that moment is hard to kind of look at how we might be able to brainstorm and be creative around that. Um, I appreciate all the ideas uh, shared. Yeah. It's a really good question. It is a good question. And my daughter had a lot of, it was more separation, which would delay us to get on the bus. And it started by, and I probably the school counselor suggested, we started reading the kissing hand the night before and, um, and we would practice, I would kiss, give her a kiss on her hand and then I had the sticker. And so we would put the sticker in a special place if it's because she was worried it would fall off her hand. And whenever she needed that at school, she could take it out because she knew that mommy was leaving her a kiss that she could tangibly touch. And it really did help. She did not need that for very long, but that became kind of our, our ritual more than a routine because it was something that was, that was needed and, um, and it really helps her get through that difficult time. And the, the ritual becomes um, we're connected, even though you're at school and I'm at work or I'm at home, we're still connected. You can do a heart, two parts of a heart and each of you keep it and put it back together when you get home. Um, it can be bring a picture of your loved one to school. So sometimes it's not about like a million strategies. It's more understanding what the meaning of that of that moment is. And sometimes that takes, well, it just takes the village, you know? So it's a great question and you're bringing it to us. So thank you. And I think sometimes reframing the outlook to, you know, um, thinking about, oh, let's, what fun way can we say goodbye at the bus? Um, are we going to high five today or fist bump or whatever it is? And I left you a note in your lunchbox. I can't wait to hear what you think of it later, you know, just kind of ways to know that you're still staying connected throughout the day, even though you're separate. Okay, the next question. Um, this uh, parent has a son and a daughter with a big age gap. And the older son often gets frustrated when his little sister copies him or just dealing with those behaviors. What are your suggestions? I wonder if it's an older, how, whatever the age of the child is, if they're old enough to have a reflective conversation with you on ways in which your the older child he is okay supporting because the little i would think the younger child wants the older child's attention right that's kind of what happens the little the little siblings whether they're a year apart or 10 years apart right they just want the love of their older sibling i'm wondering if having a conversation by hearing your your older child's voice in ways to problem solve that might be helpful because they might be able to give you some ideas as well as to what works for them and what they're comfortable um, sharing with regard to supporting the need of the younger child, as well as respecting his needs as well. Like maybe it's, you know, would you mind 
taking a walk, you know, through the, the woods today and Wednesday for some special sibling time. And then you can kind of, you know, have your own time and, and I can redirect the younger sibling to do some other activity. But hearing the voice of the, and meeting, trying to meet the needs of, of both children is so important in trying to problem solve. And I think sometimes too, you know, helping them feel a little bit in control of the moment too. So give him, you know, how about this time for the next five minutes, do silly things he can copy. And then also let him know, okay, now I need a break. And then, you know, kind of encouraging that separation too in a constructive and healthy way. Okay, at the beginning, um, all three of you pretty much mentioned play therapy. <laughs> so we've had some questions about that because uh, in one parent says that it was recommended by her pediatrician. However, she struggled finding a place to get these services. So I, I don't know if you have any recommendations on that. So a lot of times we're referring to play therapy too. And I think if you're in Fairfax County, a, a difficulty is a lot of places don't accept insurance, but what they might be able to do is provide um, a receipt. So if your insurance takes an out of network provider, that's a possibility. There's also um, a sliding scale option. So all this being said, I do have like a, a play therapy uh, community resource sheet that I can pass out if you wanna email to me or email me, I can um, send that to you. And I'm Amy Shelton. <laughs> why don't Why don't you, Amy? Why don't you send it to me, Lisa? Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then when we send out the resources, we can include that with everyone. Absolutely. Okay. So you're not getting hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Oh no. Okay. No, thank you. I will go ahead and send that to you. All right, everyone. Um, just wanted to uh, maybe finish things up. And uh, if we just would like anyone, if you have any more questions to please go ahead and put those in the chat. We would love to um, you know, hear from you um, if you have any further questions for our team this morning. But just as a reminder, um, we will be sending out a copy of the presentation and the resources that um, Amy just uh, referred to, uh, along with the link to the YouTube video, um, and that you will get that probably the beginning of next week. So please stay tuned. Um, and we wanna make sure that you get those resources that you need. Also, um, if you are looking for any of the books that Laura mentioned, um, or any other books that, that you might be interested in, we would, we would love to help you with that here at the Parent Resource Center. Um, we can actually um, find those books for you if you wanna take a look at our library, um, which I did post in the chat. Um, we are happy to check those books out to you and send them to your child's school if um, you can't get here to Dunloring to pick them up. So do reach out to us. We would be really happy to share those resources with you and make sure that you get them. All right, we have another question. Um, do you all have any home resources for zones of regulation? My son talks about it often. If your son is accessing it at school, I would certainly encourage you to reach out to the teacher or whomever is um, facilitating that learning. And there are home, there are pieces that can certainly be practiced and reinforced at home. And it would be wonderful if you did that because that helps our children generalize mm -hmm. how to regulate across multiple settings and situations. Yes, on that note, social emotional learning unfolds throughout the lifespan and FCPS has brought um, just really thoughtful attention to these skills. And so, Michelle, it's a great it's a great question around practicing um, and, 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 and practicing similar language. And, and it sounds like it's something your son really has connected with. And that's fantastic. And then you get to support it as a parent. So that is really where we're headed as a district. How do we share and translate these skills, school, home, community? So it's a wonderful reminder. So um, Amy, hey, thanks for your question. Amy is asking whether or not the Parent Resource Center would have any um, uh, parent or caregiver chat chats um, 
coming up uh, in the evening. Um, we don't have any scheduled right now. Last, last summer, we actually ran something called Parent to Parent, and it was an opportunity for parents to kind of connect and network um, and talk with each other, and uh, we helped to facilitate those conversations. We are thinking about doing that again this summer, so please do stay tuned. Um, we will have, we will advertise that, and we will put it up on our website as well. Uh, so we would, we would, uh, we really appreciate you asking about that, and uh, we really would like to continue those conversations. So thank you. All right. Um, so um, with no other um, questions. Uh, I would like to thank everyone for coming today. Uh, Laura and Lori and Amy, thank you so much uh, for all of the strategies and resources uh, that you presented to our families today. Um, I think we all learned something new today and uh, we'll be able to take that using forward. Thank you everyone for joining us and we hope that you have a wonderful weekend and look forward to having you all here again with us. So thank you. Thank you everyone.